Our next speaker, um, Sasha Coles, um, is the uh, design director of Aspect Studios, one of Australia's leading design practices, and he's also the adjunct professor uh, at UTS in Sydney. Uh, please welcome Sasha. Hello all, thank you Henry, thank you Landlab, thank you NZILA, and uh, maybe wait for that to come on. Time's ticking, but the presentation's not on there. So I'll just chat. Um, what we, I guess what we traditionally do when we start a presentation is to uh, recognise traditional elders and the land in which we're meeting and talking, um, and so I would like to do that first and foremost. Okay, so kia ora all. Um, in the, the language of Gadigal, which is the local people of Sydney, it's uh, g'day is budjeri uh, gamaru. And uh, it's significant that I even say this because it's a language which is coming back from uh, extinction. You've heard a little bit about our fraught history and many of you know the relationships between uh, indigenous culture of Australia. Um, and contemporary society, and it's a, it's a very fraught issue. You have a much more sophisticated, um, real and deep conversation here around culture and identity. Uh, and I just want to say that you might think it's not perfect, um, but you have a quality here and a process which I think is um, certainly an international benchmark is worthy of taking offshore. Uh, so, that's who I am. Uh, Aspect Studios, we've, well, just a quick summary. Uh, we've grown into what is actually quite a large design practice. There's about 160 of us. Um, we're in Brisbane, our little baby in Brisbane. We're in Adelaide. We're in Melbourne, which is the, the sort of the, the place that we grew out of. Um, of course, I run Sydney. Uh, we're also in Shanghai. Um, we don't really ever talk about numbers or growth strategies as in taking over new places. All of those studios have been started by people who have a passion, who have approached us and have wanted to actually start something with us in those places. Um, and so that's how we've grown, literally around great people. I like this, agents of positive change. Um, it's a bit of a catchphrase, but I like the idea of agents because it's not all about us, it's through us that we make change, and we're optimists. I certainly am an optimist. Uh, I found it hard over the last day or two listening to some of the talks here, Julian, wherever you are, um, uh, but it's real. And um, we need to keep our optimism, um, but focus on the challenges ahead. So Henry asked me um, when we were briefed on this just to talk about my work. And so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna talk about five projects, and I'm gonna do it relatively quickly. But I did want to reflect a little bit. Ground Up Urbanism is the title I gave it because I had to give it a title. Um, but I actually like to think locally, act locally, and hopefully if you keep your head down, you do good work, it has an international uh, resonance as well. Sydney, where I'm from, or Watane, is the Gadigal word for Sydney Cove. Um, it's, as I mentioned before, it's a highly contested place. It's a tough history for many. Um, we're at the very beginnings of a conversation about reconciliation now, and um, you know, you can't gild the lily. There is a long way to go. We have no protocols. We've got no way of uh, designing and engaging, really, which is structured into our design process. So for me as a designer, if I want to engage and I want to not recolonize every time I do a project, at the moment, it's up to me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But it's Gadigal country. Uh, there's a big political change, there's a big cultural change happening. Um, and anyway, I, I've pulled a few things out which I think are important to me and to our office in the way we think. Local lessons. So this is, this is literally where I live. This is my place. This is post-war, uh, Surrey Hills, Redfern, inner city. You can see here that it's um, not necessarily focusing on livability. This is really about post-war, the, the economy, jobs and housing. Um, the little red lines that you can see there, uh, that's my house. That's where our studio was for many, many years. That's my kid's school. Um, it's all within this sort of 500 metre radius. That's it today. Um, through fantastic governance, um, through a focus on livability, we've got some of the, the most um, green streets, connected streets, 
and incredible parklands which are around here. But it's still very dense, very urban, um, lots of social housing, lots of um, inequality in terms of wealth. Uh, and that makes the suburb an extremely interesting and vital place to live and work. A diagram here which just shows some of our projects. I'll show some of these today. But again, my house, my studio now in Redfern, my old studio, kids' school, school that I went to school in. I used to live in Redfern. I haven't really come very far. This is big for me here. Um, and some of the projects that we're lucky enough to work on, which are actually spectacular projects. We're in, like I see here, we're in a bit of a purple patch. It's a combination of demographics, of growth, and incredible governance from, mainly from local, but now also from state government. We have a different system to yours here. We have a three-tiered political system, local, state, and federal. Uh, and unfortunately, that creates a lot of issues in terms of uh, governance for major projects. Um, but look, I just wanted to talk a little bit about where I believe my interest in public realm and public life came from. And I think it is around street life. This is a little shot, again, same period, 1949, Surrey Hills, post-war, and really not a lot of joy or amenity in this image. Take the same image now, Macalone Street. This is the kind of poster child for ground up, uh, kind of guerrilla gardening. Um, this is just around the corner from us. And what I love about this, it has many names. It's loved by tourists, by locals. Um, it's been born from the community that are in this lane. They just keep putting out pots and keep gardening. Uh, it's known as Cat Alley. But it's just this wonderful, community-led, very inclusive process. Why have I got this? Well, I reckon this is, for me, where it all started. Um, hopefully, a lot of you know what this is. Um, this is, of course, one of the most inclusive streets you will ever find. Um, this is, of course, Sesame Street. And when I grew up in the early 70s, late 70s, um, you know, th this was highly influential. Have a look at it. Tactical urbanism, right here. <laughs> we've got racial uh, equality. We've got gender equality. We've got species equality. <laughs> We've got everything happening on the stoop of probably a brownstone or similar. It's all happening in the street. Uh, and this was symbolic of that kind of optimism of the late 70s that I grew up with. It was solar, not nuclear. Um, it was very can-do. It was feminism. Um, so this is the environment that I grew up in. It's the kind of environment that I grew up in at home as well, my education. And so this is where I live now. This is my little laneway uh, in Redfern, my kids and, you know, their playground, which is just our, our back lane, formerly just a line of garages. We've started to get the gardening going. And it's become this place where our entire neighbourhood comes in. And it's just a shot here on the right, but essentially this is really common for us. We eat outdoors in the lane a lot. And we have this kind of amazing eclectic mix of wealth, of gender, of sexual preference, of colour. And it's, it's not curated or, or created artificially, it just happens. And it's a simple thing, but it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and beyond the projects that I talk about, this is the kind of stuff that matters to me. So I, I would say that um, most of our work is driven for people, um, with people. Again, I'm a humanist, an optimist, uh, and it's probably the theme of this presentation, I would say. So these are some of our guys in the office. Um, recently, We've been um, in, in Australia having a debate around um, marriage equality, same-sex couples being able to marry. Uh, and, of course, it was highly topical. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But I guess, um, you know, we can't do everything, but we do need to engage with the politics of life and the politics of public space. Uh, where my studio is, is, is Redfern. It's the urban centre for, I suppose, indigeneity in Sydney. Um, it's got a, a very deep history that I, I won't go into now, but the signs are everywhere. Um, it's highly political. You see it on the street. Um, you know, occupation is everywhere. There are reminders of a 60,000-year continuous occupation of land, which are in our urban environment on every street corner of where our studio is. Uh, I particularly love this one. I think it um, just shows this idea of resistance and continual occupation. It's different. We choose to be there. We choose to be there, not in the city, um, for the village uh, life and for this complex social structure. So for us as an office, I would say equality matters. 
Um, this, is, this is on the theme of the, um, the same-sex marriage, and this is actually, for those of you who don't know, this is a conservative politician, our ex-prime minister, um, Tony Abbott, and this mural went up around the corner from our office, which is just fantastic, and it's him, him marrying himself. Incidentally, his, his sister is um, quite an outspoken politician, a lesbian, who is um, pro-same-sex marriage, so it was quite an interesting time. But equality is important. There are small steps happening now. This is a sign from our local government where dual language has started to come in. So it's a simple welcome in Gadigal, in Sydney, but these are the, the first steps. Really, government is lacking, needs to do a lot more. Private sector, particularly with the uh, equality, uh, marriage equality conversation has really excelled. Um, this is the CEO of Qantas very outspoken in terms of what his company believes in. Not everyone loves it. Um, you know, clearly they were ahead of the curve in terms of uh, the majority of political, um, the political uh, positivity towards this issue, but not everyone was there. So the conversation is really being picked up by the private sector um, quicker than public sector. Let your ethics lead. We talk a lot about this in the office. What projects do we want to do? What projects do we say no to? And we do say no to a lot of work if it doesn't align with our values. And that's something that I think we've only done in the last five years, really, when we've matured and just realised, no, that's, it's not worth our while to just try and take on everything. Uh, and these couple of uh, images here, there's been some very political um, conversations recently around heritage and housing and social housing in particular. This one, um, as, a, as a real calling card, this is Sirius, which is a brutalist building uh, in Circular Quay, the most incredible view. And it's social housing that's been there ever since I was a kid uh, and government wants to sell this now to redevelop it. And it's a, it's a question of values. And um, so, to values. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Barangaroo, but um, I, I've been personally caught up in this project for um, the last six or seven years and highly political, highly fraught, and probably on reflection, I mean, I've changed the way... I put this in the presentation today. I had no idea how I was going to speak about it. I've never presented it. We don't really promote it on our website or anything like that. Um, it is a complex project. It's topical here because it's a waterfront project. You've got your ports, which you need to find a future for, talking about America's Cup. There's a whole range of, you know, vacant land that obviously will go in time. Um, but that was the case for Barangaroo. It was a, a shipping terminal, previously an industrial place, an airstrip, a concrete strip right in this incredible western location of our city. So, highly political. Another ex-Prime Minister who factors uh, in this talk, this is Paul Keating this time, and uh, as you can see what he said to um, Clover Moore, that she's for sandal-wearing, muesli-chewing, bike-riding pedestrians. That's like me and our office, um, and yet we're involved in this project. Um, the, I guess the takeout for Barangaroo is that uh, it started in a, in a competitive process, um, a project won by a local team, Hill Thallis, Paul Berkmeyer and Jane Irwin, and what I think was actually an incredible scheme. Structured the public realm uh, first and then delivered a whole series of development parcels. So they uh, ended up getting fired from the job and um, I think the political engine of space and the need to grow the fintech economy, large floor plate buildings, 2,000 square metres, we really need to drive this, we need to do it tomorrow, we need to grow the city. That was the engine for the project as it ended up. Um, I'm being a little bit facetious, but essentially that's the motivation for the project. You can see the incredible opportunity. This is a master plan that we ended up um, doing when we became involved in the project through the private sector. We ended up focusing on this part down through here, um, which was Barangaroo South, a very sort of urbane part of the city now. But in terms of numbers, it's home to 23,000 workers and 33,000 visitors. They're massive numbers. So it actually has populated this former desert. But what's the legacy? So the waterfront is nice. If you go there, you will enjoy sitting on the west-facing harbour. You will love the food and you will think Sydney is bloody beautiful. Um, don't know if that's enough. It hits all the sustainability targets. It's won more sustainability awards than any other project. It does all of those things incredibly well. 
But for me, it's got, I mean, it's got great architecture. Um, it's got places for people to sit and to promenade. Um, and again, it hits a lot of those kind of livability um, targets that we all try and, and make. But it has left me kind of wanting more. And I think it's because it's happened so quickly. New streets have happened. They're pedestrian focused. There's very few cars in this precinct at all. There's probably more activity on the ground plane, in fact there is, than any other place in the city. There's all the mechanical plant, all the dead facades have all been minimised because there's such low cars, they're all in a, conti in a continuous basement underneath. But what's missing is this kind of sense of humanity, this sense of scale. Big buildings happened overnight. Um, landscape is everywhere. You know, the streets come through. It's definitely a, a strong part of the city, uses the city's materials. But it's really a need for this kind of scale, and this is what we're working on at the moment. So we're actually beyond the big project, the multi-billion dollar project, the buildings are there, the people have come, and what they really want is nooks, is places, is free seats, places in sun, art, the ability just to connect and to talk, all the things that we've been discussing uh, over the last couple of days, but which haven't really been considered at a master plan level, but they're starting to invest into them now. There's landscape on the roofs, they're beautiful places. There's landscape in the buildings. These are part of the, the, the projects that we've worked on. Uh, we've tried to create as much light and as much nature within uh, the building as possible. And don't get me wrong, these are benchmark projects in terms of uh, children's development in um, children's care. Um, but still, I think there are questions to be asked and uh, I might, I'll, I'll leave this project there. To get to uh, a project that I suppose we've, um, we've really enjoyed working on. It's called the Goods Line, and again, people have talked a lot about uh, infrastructure projects, um, active transport loops, and I really enjoyed Ryan's conversation uh, around Atlanta, um, because this project here is really about a connective project. It has been talked in the media as being, you know, Sydney's version of the High Line, like most projects that take on a piece of post-industrial uh, land, but it's completely different. The High Line is magic for its own reasons, separated, um, a beautiful jewel above uh, Manhattan. This is an opportunity to reconnect and re-stitch Sydney. So where it sits is as a conduit from Central Station all the way down to Darling Harbour. It sits just off the shoulder, just off the ridge of a high street um, and it connects A to B. That was our brief. Obviously, this was our pitch, it was a competition, we ended up winning this, um, but the whole concept for us was to not just stitch north-south, but try and reconnect the city east to west. And if you know Sydney, it's very topographical, like Auckland, ridges and valleys, and hard to navigate across. So the whole concept was to create a series of different places along a line. Um, these event platforms, which you can start to see in the images that follow, uh, set to, to program uses for community, but also people moving through the site. The whole idea of construction was looking at this, uh, this previous uh, concept of economy uh, and innovation, and this is probably more startups in this part of Sydney, in Ultimo and Piemont, than anywhere else in Sydney. So we're, we're trying to use new techniques and new modules. This was all done precast off-site brought to site and, for, and, uh, and installed from one side to the other. Very um, simply, no wet trades, and put exactly on top of the, where the rail line used to be to create this new connective part to the city. And what it's done essentially is to do what these projects do if they're well invested from government. It's, um, it's invited new development to, to join the, the goods line, so this is a the Chachak Wing building, which is a, a Frank Gehry building, which is a, a very, um, it's an incredibly beautifully crafted building that sits as a, as a university campus business school right on the goods line. Uh, an odd place for such an eminent architect to, to put a building in Sydney, but when you go there you can see that it's an attempt to re-energise the entire precinct. So some images which talk about that and we've seen a lot of developments marketing this piece of infrastructure for their new residential development, so in close proximity to the goods line, um, which, which is interesting. A lot of effort to kind of blur the boundary between pedestrianisation and cycling. It's an active transport area, it's not a commuter link, uh, and it works well. There was a lot of nerves around this from our client, um, but we've just let it be. We retained 
the, the most significant asset of the site, which was all of the large ficus helii, the big trees. Um, essentially, together, they're the biggest structure on the site. And tried to create a series of little rooms for people, for individuals. Everything has been thought about um, through the lens of a person and what it might be like to sit as one or as many. Uh, there are PowerPoints in the benches to try and facilitate uh, working outdoors. It's a kind of a quasi-university spine. Um, and success for me has been seeing it used and curated in many different ways than we would expect. Short film festivals, architectural festivals, yoga on the grass, those things that we all put in Photoshop images have actually come true uh, on this, which is, which is quite fantastic. But I suppose the legacy of this has really been about connecting an absolutely disconnected part of the city. And that, that will be the legacy for this project. There's an ecology element to it, 70% natives. Although it's small in terms of the garden areas, um, it's still significant and we see them change. It's not irrigated. Um, and it's a lovely thing to return to, to see what's, what's thriving. So the next project I'd like to talk about is, is nearby. It's um, called the Alumni Green. And again, it was a competition which we went in for, which we ended up winning. Um, actually rarer than um, you might imagine in Sydney. Competition culture is, is not as strong as our European colleagues. Um, but this was an open competition which we won and the master plan calls for a sticky campus and the idea was simple, it was to, was to basically green one of the most urbanised parts of the city which is the UTS campus, uh, famously known for its brutalist building designed to stop people from congregating together. So the university has had this incredible mind shift, now it's about bringing people together and making sure they stay stuck in the campus. So these little diagrams talk about um, the tightness of space and also the opportunity we have, which is just around the edges of uh, essentially an aggregated green space to create places for people. Um, this is the competition boards. And, um, you know, of course we extended our scope. Our scope was really just for this area down through here, but we extended it to, to change the nature of an existing street. Um, to build into uh, a future building down through here, grand set of stairs, but essentially to create three places, a green, a heart and a garden, very simple diagram, and really focus on the experience at the edge uh, of all of those. So most of our design development was again jumping down in scale, was operating at the scale of a human on a bench, was looking at the way we could um, utilise this level change. This is a roof garden, so this, is, this entire thing is a green roof which sits on top of a library, the entire UTS library sits underneath this. So you can imagine the technical issues that go with that. And there's a hall which sits uh, underneath this as well for basketball and sports. So this is the kind of final layer. So we had to fight for every single centimetre of depth and soil and weight. Um, so this edge became very important. How do we not just have some kind of boring retaining wall? Well, we got the builders in very early, a very different process, worked together uh, to develop techniques. And the end result is, is here on the right, uh, roof garden on top, new science building, library underneath this, couple of oculus so you can look down and see the robots getting the books, which is amazing. Uh, and the edges down through here, light filled, so the green space where there's sun and the garden, a much cooler contemplative space um, where it's overshadowed. And I'll just go through these, I'll flick through. Um, but you can start to see that this is not a conservative university environment. It's much more loose fit. There's many more things in terms of programming that aren't really in your face. Essentially, it's an urban garden, a lot of greenery. There was no trees, no, no greenery, no garden here, just concrete and uh, fake grass previously. Um, so this is a new type of experience for, for this very urban uh, campus in the city. And Bart, that looks like one of your renders, actually, but that's a built project up on the, on the roof uh, of the science faculty. And this is a, a roof garden which is being monitored by the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS, who we, we work with, so we can get some, uh, some data on the performance of that. One of the, the more topical things that um, is happening right here is your, your light rail discussion. In fact, in an Uber on the way here, I heard this horrible man on talkback radio telling us about what the real ambition for light rail in Auckland was. And it was for you to get out of your car, lose your dependence on, or lose your opportunity that you have with your private vehicle, and get on public transport. And this is the way that your government will control you. And that's what it's about. 
And uh, so I told the guy to turn it off and um, gave him three stars. <laughs> Awkward. But um, <laughs> anyway, for the last uh, six years or so, we've been working, I think, maybe, no, less, sorry, less than that, half that time. Three to four years, we've been working on the light rail project in Sydney. And it is transformational. It is going through the main street in our city. And I'll get to the, the stats in a minute. Idea was not born from the state government that's in control of it now. It actually came from local government. It came from your hero, one of my heroes, uh, Jan Gell Clovermore, who is our Lord Mayor in Sydney, who is an incredible leader, um, a design advocate, and the leader of probably the healthiest um, government that, that I've been exposed to. The concept was going from Circular Quay all the way up George Street, three squares linked by the light rail. Again, infrastructure as agent for change. Whole series of other projects hang off the back of this. And so we've, this is kind of elevated into all the planning documents now. And uh, we've been working um, on the sort of delivery side, the design side of this uh, for the last few years. So it's 12 kilometres, 19 stops. It goes from Circular Quay out to one of our universities, University of New South Wales. And this is really just a stage one. It's not a new idea either. This is Sydney, um, pre-private vehicle, trams, beautiful buildings, um, you know, a wonderful streetscape. This is the George Street we grew up with, uh, which really it was faster to walk than ever drive a car down this street. We tried a few other amazing innovations in terms of uh, public transport. This was the monorail that some of you may have seen but is now no longer in Sydney. Um, and this is the vision for what light rail could be, connecting some of our most iconic buildings uh, through a public realm which is, which is open to all. Some of the, the visualisations, um, some of the, the facts about how intense it is. And then, I was just saying before to a, a colleague earlier, what the government has done, it's, this is nowhere near finished, the light rail, but they've started to open up so that community um, can engage with it. They can essentially win the hearts and minds of people about what light rail can bring. This is one little part of George Street, um, but it's delivered yeah, over 2,000 square metres of public domain to the city centre. Um, and this is the little bit that they've opened up. It's temporary. All of the concrete blocks are, are there as temporary measures. Um, but essentially it's done this, recalibrated the city positively. And they strategically opened this little bit up at Christmas, which was very wise, so everybody had access to uh, the main city boulevard, created a range of seating opportunities, and were able to re-engage with the city in a way that we haven't been able to do for many, many years, pre-vehicles. Oh, there's a public art piece coming, which uh, I guess is just another evolution. Once you build this piece, you build the laneways which come off it, you build the public art. This is just... I, I only included this because it's very topical at the moment. The, the, it's called Cloud Arch. Some people call it the tapeworm. Others call it other names. Um, it will be an engineering feat, but it will really mark the completion of the light rail when it opens. Um, OK, final project. One of my favourite projects that we've ever done, and in a way, a return to the essentials of gardeners. You know, we, this is a very horticultural project for us. Most of the projects I've shown you have been in urban projects, um, urban environments, this is not that. This is in one of our most um, loved parks in the eastern suburbs, I would say, the, the, the city centre. Sydney is now, as I'm sure you've seen in other presentations, modelling itself in three cities. The Harbour City, which is where we're talking about, um, Parramatta, greater city of Parramatta, and then the sort of the, the western Sydney, so the city of three cities, and that comes from a, a state government greater um, cities plan. So Centennial Park sits as uh, this wonderful asset for the Harbour City. Uh, it's managed by the Botanic Gardens Trust. So we had the opportunity, again, we won this through a sort of competitive process, an ideas process uh, with a tender, and it was to design a children's wild play garden. Um, we were bequeathed money, or the client was bequeathed money by uh, a foundation, and uh, it's, it's quite an investment. You, don't, you won't see this in every municipality. Um, a large investment, about $4 million park, but the idea of it is to completely bring kids back to the essentials, back to nature. 
to deprogram them, to get rid of the digital devices, to learn and to play in a completely natural uh, environment. This was the reason behind it, and this is kind of striking. I don't usually use figures much, but 80% of Australian children and young people between that bracket of 5 and 17 don't meet our national guidelines of just one hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day, um, which is pretty staggering. Um, and so part of this is to create a, a destination, to create an opportunity. It's free to anyone. Uh, it's open within the park. Um, again, it's highly horticultural. There's no off-the-shelf parts to it. The whole idea is to be immersed in a kind of nature which is absolutely wild and imaginative, but also calls to the previous nature of this place, pre-colonial nature. Um, there's over, uh, I think there's some facts up here, but there's about 13,000 new plants that we brought into this. And, um, and, you know, we engaged very early with the plant suppliers and, again, with our builders. And so it was an iterative and a collaborative process to do this. So we, we really conceived of a, a plan which had a series of rooms. Banksia tunnels, this is the eastern suburbs Banksia scrub, which was the endemic um, foliage of this area, ecology. Uh, it's actually pretty rough. It's actually not stuff that you want to get involved in. Lots of spikes. Uh, you don't really want to go through it. So we created a series of tunnels, which we worked with a, a mob called Cave Urban, who are incredible. And they build these bamboo structures. And, um, and so they created this opportunity for us to weave Banksia and Tegrafolia over these structures in time. And then we remove the bamboo, and we're left with these arches of, uh, of Banksia and Tegrafolia, which you, you really have to get down the scale of a uh, less than a kid um, you know, something like a wild boar to move through this. Um, and then we move into the artesian water basin and we had that fantastic presentation today on, on water and you know about Australia and the, the driest continent on earth and the artesian water basin. And so there's a story that we're trying to tell through this uh, by the creation of a water element in the middle. All of the site has been benched. There's just sand. This is literally a sand landscape. Um, and I'm just going to flick through these images I'm conscious of a flashing time down through here. But the creation of a kind of a prehistoric water element in the middle of the park. And again, there are jets and there are, there are misters and there's a font and it tells this story about water moving from the highest point down into the sort of dry creek into the lakes district. The bamboo forest, what's the fastest material that we could get to surround a kind of a, a, a tree house which we wanted to make look like it was built and conceived by children. Um, of course, it was highly engineered. Um, you know, we worked an incredible fabricator to do this, um, but the treehouse is really the centrepiece of this project. And just some images here to, to illustrate that process. Um, it being unfurled, and this is one of the nests. There's, a, there's two nests, and, they, and it sits atop the bamboo forest. Um, there's no instructions about how to use this. There's no barriers, there's no fences. Of course, there's the stainless steel around it, the mesh, but in terms of the, the bridge and the way you get there, Kids can fall, they do fall. We encourage them to take risks. That's the entire motivation of this project is to step outside of boundaries and to learn what you're able to do and socialize through that behavior. There's a series of mounds which are highly horticultural. Um, they're planted, they tell the story of the, the turtles which are in Centennial Park, the turtle mounds, and there's a dry creek which is a kind of a, a nod to the former landscape that was, that was here. This was, this was swamp grounds which leads down into, into this area here, which is highly planted. Um, one of the areas which no one will know is that there's this balance beam. Uh, I'll just tell a quick story. This is the long-finned eel, which is a resident of Centennial Park. It's a hero. We love it. No one's ever going to know that this sculpture is uh, homage to it, but it leaves Centennial Park, goes through the stormwater system, out through the lakes, goes into Botany Bay, and then goes to Numea to mate, and then comes back. So we, we reckon that we should celebrate this thing. And so uh, it's got its own sort of homage to it within the garden. But the main thing is this free range area here for kids just to play, to use sticks, to build teepees, to get muddy, to just get wet, to create anything, maybe to bash something, to climb something, just to be in nature. And it's in a way, it's sad that we have to create these environments to facilitate that. Um, but in these highly urbanised environments, that's exactly uh, what we have to do. So there's a quick little outtake on, on this and you'll, 
I didn't know it had music, um, so, but it sounds dramatic. The, from the Sydney Cliffs down into, uh, this is the water play zone. And uh, you start to see the amount of, of planting that's within this. Really, it's a horticultural project. It's like a mini botanic gardens. And thankfully, we, we have the facilities to maintain it and manage it like a botanic gardens because it's part of that trust. And the people that are managing it now, um, they own this project. We don't own it anymore. We've done our bit. They have taken it on and they're doing an incredible job. This is actually uh, Louise, one of um, my, my colleagues, uh, her son, um, who's testing this out across the drawbridge. And uh, I'll leave you with that. Thank you.